And we now move on to questions to the Assembly Commission. The first question on the list has been withdrawn, so I call Martin O'Mullier. I call Martin O'Mullier. Um, I, I beg your pardon. I'll ask John Corley. Pardon me, Deputy Speaker. Qu question number two. Question two. And the question. I'm really relieved, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that the uh, questioner is not following on with the supplementary on homelessness, uh, given he didn't have his opportunity for a supplementary in the last, in the last section. Uh, I appreciate the, the member is relatively new to the Assembly, so just by way of background, the current policy uh, was adopted on uh, the 7th of May 2013. Uh, it wasn't one that was adopted unanimously. There are different views uh, on this. And both prior to that and subsequent to that, the issue has been raised a number of occasions, uh, both in correspondence and directly at the Commission meeting itself. We're currently in the position that the Commission uh, on the policy has uh, an equality screening exercise, and it is anticipated that that will hopefully be completed for the next uh, Commission meeting, which is due at the end of November and is likely to be discussed uh, at that. Colin Martin, Miller for supplementary. Uh, Colin Martin, I'll ask Con I want to thank the uh, Commission for, for that response. Tasuologum gudagun she hig hig fragra gasta erin kesho. I do hope it, it uh, reaches a speedy conclusion. Um, I, I'm considering sending a nice uh, Irish language Christmas card so we get a nice answer in Irish. It certainly seems to me, if I may ask. Um, Can we have a question, uh, may, please? May I ask, as part of this screening, what has been the result of the equality impact assessment? In terms of the screening, the screening is due to come back to us uh, within the next week, so I'm, I'm not going to be in a position to, to prejudge that. Um, obviously, and I'm sure everyone would want to see speedy conclusions, whether that means necessarily the decision which particular people, whether myself or others, would, would welcome, we will have to simply uh, await and see uh, in relation to that. But uh, uh, I'm sure, obviously, the member will be very busy with, with Christmas cards in the, the days to come. I call Dominic Bradley for, for a supplementary. I got the last call. Erin Tim McKean, Tasha Tamil, the Vlintio Hinganish of the Korya Khan, Egan Commission, Major Policy Gilliga Generalta, Don Chonol, is Kevin Lum Gurk, Gorkorme, Aina, Hestach, Erin Korya Kanshin, Achnir Hanik. Policy or be ashin o hin ele. Um, so, boil am I ifri den den uh, wal commission kahur uh, a jigling of egg bra la policy kimshi hach gailiga don chonol. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. At some years ago now, since the commission conducted uh, a um, uh, conducted a survey on the uh, Irish language policy for the Assembly in general. Uh, I remember submitting a submission to that um, uh, exercise. I, I, as to this point, nothing has remember, come out of come that, and that's almost five years ago. When can we expect to see uh, a comprehensive policy for Irish in the Assembly? Well, in terms of, uh, in terms of the, I can't really answer from five years ago because it wasn't I suppose in post at that stage. Uh, the Assembly Commission, I think, there was a meeting held in 2013 uh, where draft language policy was brought under consideration. There isn't an agreement at the Commission uh, on a, an agreed Irish language policy. It is, I suppose, an area where there is a difference of opinion within the, the Commission. And as such, I, I'm not in a position to give the member a particular time or date in which there could be any level of agreement on that. I can just simply uh, indicate to the, the member that there is an agreement, certainly, uh, within the Commission on a, a policy at the moment. Moving on, I call Jim Allister. Question two. An answer will be given by uh, Pat Ramsey. Yeah, Mr Deputy Speaker, I propose to take questions three and seven together, and I thank both members for their questions. The Assembly Commission appointed Tracy Brawlers to undertake the root project in April. And work on site started in late May with a projected contract period of 52 weeks. Although the contract has fallen slightly behind in some areas of the work, he is still re reporting that the works remain on target for completion by the end of May 2015. The estimated construction cost, taking account of the working restrictions placed on the contractor, which is clearly obvious for members on a Monday and Tuesday in particular, and Wednesday, the estimated construction cost 
is 5.4 million and the approved contract sum was 5 million. The project team has been issuing regular postmasters to report on progress in an effort to keep all building users, members of staff and political parties up to date on this progress. The primary objective of the project is to provide a waterproof solution to ongoing problems, but the works also include the refurbishment of and replacement of all roof-mounted building services installations and incorporates environmental improvements, including the installation of photovoltaic panels. Work to date has included the removal of the majority of redundant roofing materials and have been recovered with proprietary waterproofing product. There have been some unfortunate incidents where inadequate temporary waterproofing measures have led to further work ingress uh, during heavy rainfall, which, which happened recently again, some of which was inevitable, with, clearly with the work of that nature. While the restrictions placed on the contract have limited the impact on the Assembly business, the Commission clearly is very conscious of the noise and disruption that building users have had to tolerate and endure, and is very grateful to all the members of staff and for the MLAs for I suppose, their patience and tolerance as well, uh, as also for a number of staff who had to be temporarily decanted, and we thank them for their cooperation as well. I call Jim Allister for a supplementary. Should I understand the answer from the member to indicate that whereas the original contract price was £5 million, it is appearing to already be almost 10 per cent over budget, and what assurance is there that there will not be further drift in that direction. And in respect of the waterproofing, is it a fact? I think the member has asked the question. Is it a fact that when part of the roof the was supposedly finished, has asked it was still leaking? Well, on the, on the latter point, which I don't mind responding to, there were some issues during the work uh, that there was further rain penetration, and one would expect that during a major construction and nature of the job, uh, and we have identified those and we're dealing with them. Um, we hope those won't occur again. The overall uh, estimated cost for the project was £5.4 million. The tender document that we received was for £5 million, so at this stage we're underpriced, we're under target, and we would hope to, to keep on, on going. Obviously, depending on circumstances as we progress with the contract, any unforeseen work, for example, well, the Assembly Commission will have to look at that. But at the moment, we are under the estimated price of the tender by almost a half a million pounds. I call Sean Lynch for supplementary. Last can call you, uh, and I want to thank the member for answering the uh, questions. Um, I know we answered one part of what was going to ask within budget, um, and I know that uh, the work is progressing because I know most of the contractors on the roof. Is the project within the time, or will it be delayed? <coughs> no, there was a delay uh, to the member for a number of reasons, uh, but we are expecting that the roof project to be on schedule to have it concluded by May next year. Uh, and with that, that, it takes a lot of effort to do that, given you're trying to manage parliamentary business here, you're trying to manage a series of committees. You're trying to relocate and decant quite a high volume of staff during that period, and we can only but be grateful for their cooperation, for their support and help during that period. I call Trevor Clark. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Speaker. Can I ask, maybe following on from one of the first questions in relation to the tender, actually, how many companies actually tendered in the original contract in the first place? Yeah, I, I don't have that information with me. Uh, I think that there was quite a few. Uh, but certainly th there was a, a contractor that was, that was approved on the procurement process and that's the contractor we have in place. I will, Mr Deputy Speaker, provide the member with that further information onto the number of people who put on a tender for the roof project. I call Danny Cahan. And, uh, I just wonder, one of those enjoying the um, plink, plink into buckets on Monday and Tuesday in, in his office. Have we got to a point where that is the end of the damage that's going to be done, or if we have further bad weather, it's likely to continue. Well, certainly, I apologise to the member. I know a number of members have been inconvenienced and disrupted as a result of the, work, the roof project, and it's something 
that the contract, along with our own staff, are very keen to minimise at the best of times. <clears throat> and certainly I could not I'm not going to stand here and dare suggest that it will not happen again. Every effort has been made to minimise any disruption, including any further rain penetration to the offices in this building. Call, call Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can I thank the members for their answers thus far? Uh, can I ask, in relation to the environmental improvements that the member spoke about, um, what impact will they have in terms of the building's carbon footprint? Yeah. <clears throat> I thank the member for his question. Clearly, leading up to and preparedness for the work, <clears throat> there was a number of areas of, of we looked at and examined, uh, certainly at an officer level and also at a commission level. And the combination of works all undertaken will significantly improve our carbon footprint by almost 30 per cent. That's a good exercise given the extent of the project and given the restrictions placed on the contract to try and improve things. So I think we are on a good safe landing in terms of 30 per cent of carbon. I call Michaela Boyle. Question four. The question will be answered again by Pat Ramsey. Deputy Speaker, I thank the member for her question. Uh, a service level agreement currently exists between the Assembly Commission and the PSNI with regard to the provision of policing within Parliament buildings. With regard to provision of policing within the buildings, PSNI provide a small team of police officers known as the Northern Ireland Assembly Police Unit, and charges are applied by the PSNI on a monthly basis at national rates. These charges are met from within the facilities directorate budget of the Assembly here. Following recent discussions between the Assembly and senior officers of PSNA, the latter provided a number of options in relation to minimising uh, the cost to the Assembly Commission, and one agreed option came forward. Uh, this change, which, which took effect on Monday, the 3rd of November, will and should result in a significant reduction in overall placing from around 523,000 to 364,000 per year. To date, placing arrangements at Parliament buildings have worked very well, and it is envisaged these changes can be brought about without any loss whatsoever in the overall service being provided by the police here, either in efficiency or effectiveness. Management team and the Commission remain confident that the placing of the Assembly will continue to be fully met. I call Michaela Boyle for supplementary. For Margaret, uh, can the Assembly Commission detail the cost of police presence in the House of Oireachtas and indeed the Scottish and Welsh Assemblies? For Margaret. Yeah. These questions come up at the Assembly Commission as well. Uh, all between the Welsh Assembly and the Scottish Assembly and the Welsh Assembly, uh, they're based on a similar, I don't have the, ex the, the, the exact pricing on costings of it, but they're based on national pricing that are previously referred to on the original answer, and, and those are proportionate to the level of policing that's here. Uh, in other places, for example, the level of policing in Westminster would be considerably and immensely much higher than they are here considerably higher in, in Wales and considerably higher in Scotland, but at the same time we're confident that we, get, we, can, meet, we can meet the challenges considering where we came from. You know, there was a an incident here with Michael Stone in late 2006 that forced us to change the course to ensure that those using this building, whether it be members of staff and MLAs, were protected. So we took that investment in the Oireachtas, for example, uh, the cost of policing is not met out of their, their commission there, but the costs in Wales and Scotland and Westminster made out of, are come out of the appropriate costs coming out of the Assembly Commissions and all the Houses. I call Jimmy Spratt. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Speaker, and I thank uh, Mr Ramsey for the answer that he, that he has given. And uh, can I congratulate the PSNI on the good job that they do here uh, in, in protecting the Assembly? But can I ask? Will the Commission look, uh, and look very soon, the fact that it's over half a million pounds a year, which is really a double dunt on the public purse, because the Justice Department provides the money for those officers already through the public purse uh, to uh, the Chief Constable. 
and here again then it's being charged over again. Effectively, what is that money being used for within the police service? That's a very important question because I don't think the public purse should be hit twice with these charges. Yeah, I thank the member for his comments and I agree with the member in terms of the excellent service that the police officers give to us all and, and ensuring that we are protected. We have and we will cons cons constantly keep all placing re on the review here depending on circumstances. At the present time we are reasonably con content with those. But I can assure the member that on the recent review, which really is what done the last weeks, has made a significant savings to the Assembly Commission of £160,000. That is no mean task given that we are receiving the same level of staffing we done here. And I think it is a matter for, for himself, he's a member of the, of the policing board, to raise those level of questions as well. But certainly I take on board the points he's made. There is, or other members of the policing board who may be here, uh, but certainly it is a matter that, that I again, as a result of it being tabled here today, if there is double pricing or double charging that I'm not aware of, I presume the cost that we were making from the Assembly Commission of over £360 was the total cost for having the police here. I call Rosaline McCorley. Cook, Little Hall. Question 5, please. The question will be answered by Peter Weir on behalf of the Commission. Okay. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. And I thank the member for her question. In June of 2013, at the request of the Chief Executive, a group of senior staff uh, comprising both genders met to discuss how the Secretariat might examine the existence of any barriers, whether those barriers were real barriers or perceived barriers, in relation to gender within the Northern Ireland Secretariat, and to consider what actions might be necessary. Following this meeting, the directors of the uh, Assembly were asked to nominate senior members of staff to form a Gender Action Plan steering group. In, in late 2013, the steering group developed a questionnaire in consultation with the Equality Commission and the Assembly's internal communications group. The questionnaire was then circulated to Secretariat staff in February of this year, and uh, following on from that questionnaire, 192 responses were received. The Gender Action Plan steering group examined the questionnaire's themes and comments against current policies, along with the organisation's decision-making structures. Details of the questionnaire, along with the recommendations and relevant uh, research and data, have been included in a final report, which has now been produced from the group. And the report will be made available after the Assembly uh, Commission meeting, which is due to consider this at its next meeting in uh, November the 26th. I call Rosalie McCauley for a supplementary. Gormaya Glas Concordia August Gumbuya Slash and Wal Asar Ragri. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the member for his answers. And Deglo Mira and Wal. And may on plan grieve Bonnie or Sprickena August Kenner and Meshe Kripnehi. Can I ask the member, will the action plan be target based and when will it be completed? Gormaya Glas. Well, in terms of the actions that will arise out of it, uh, the report recommends, I mean, there's a considerable amount of recommendations uh, from the report. Uh, for instance, in terms of detail on it, it details, um, I think, at a quick count, 10 separate areas, very wide ranging in terms of areas for action. Uh, and some of those will have, have differential impacts as part of that. Um, the report itself, there, therefore, recommends that a working group is established to take forward these actions, which have been identified on a range of areas, uh, areas you know, such as affecting the decision-making structures, dignity at work, um, staff member protocols, childcare schemes, caring responsibilities, just to name a few of those. Um, and indeed, once the actions have been identified to develop and consult upon a gender action plan, it's anticipated the working group will have developed a gender action plan by April and then will consult with staff in the, the May-June period of 2015 with a final report to be tabled at the Assembly Commission um, in September 2015. Moving on, I call Tom Elliott. Good speaker. Um. I got the last can call I was quite on cash than a shay because Hainjig a ragger to the I was gown with us the quality as a guest in a Kuni Commission on Chunol Leshon to Laha Ravesha Omlon Service on Chunol August or quality and you lie do in a busage arrogant the octopuncha and if we engage she ne care of winter three of her dovey loom punt her a care of Lena in Avrek new Kachakas Govila Je Crocky and Garusha Dushlon Wara Ak Jairi Leshon Commission, Bruna Bolskia, 
a umper, agus Jerry Lesh Freshen, Rear, Er Elevo Quality, Er Hervishi, Elevator, Sheer Foss, and Yon Gurdlai Doi on Busage. Um, Deputy Speaker, I propose to answer questions 6 and 11 together, and I thank the members for their questions. The Assembly Commission has continued to deliver a complete range of services to the Assembly and its members, despite a reduction in its cash budget of 8.9%, equating to 4.32 million over the four years of the spending review uh, 2010 period. This cut has already presented major challenges. However, the Commission has managed to absorb inflationary pressures, meet an increasing demand for services from members within this reduced budget all allocation. And I'm sure all the members here will um, applaud the, the, mem the workers in the Assembly for the amount of work that they do. The draft budget for 2015-16 proposes that the DEL resource allocation for the Assembly Commission will remain unchanged from its 2014-15 levels. While this allocation is flatlined in cash terms, it represents a cut in real terms of almost 800,000 for next year. So basically that means since 2010-11, for, uh, for a five-year period, there's a 19% real term cut, which I'm sure you'll agree with me, that's a significant uh, amount of money. The Commission will continue to meet its statutory requirements to provide the Assembly with the property, staff and services it requires. Members will also know that some 15.9 million in the Commission's budget relates to costs that are established by the Independent Financial Review Panel and cannot be amended upwards or downwards by the Commission. We will, the Commission will seek to meet in upward inflationary pressures for 2016, 15, 16, and this Commission is members' like time is, is up. Okay. I call Tom Elliott for supplementary. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, given that uh, the, the member has indicated that there is no basically financial reduction in, in the budget for 2015-16, but in real terms there, there is a reduction, where is the Commission going to find that reduction? Can she point to any specific areas of reduction? Well, um, and I absolutely agree with the member. Um, while there hasn't been uh, a reduction there, in real terms there's been a significant reduction and given that the assembly commission budget is relatively small compared to we're not a department but compared to the other departments it, it hits uh, money cut hits the assembly commission and um, so how will the priority services be identified we the assembly commission will continue to work closely with members and parties to ensure that its corporate priorities are aligned to its statutory provisions first of all uh, um, it will also be done within the context of budget constraints and what the commission will do is carry out a full review of the range of services that are currently provided, their associated costs, and will ensure the resources are allocated to those functions and uh, activities which are essential for the running of uh, an institution such as the Assembly. I call Joanne Dobson. Mr Deputy Speaker, can I also thank the member for her answer? I'm aware the Commission has previously engaged in a business efficiency programme which looked at each area across the Secretariat and identified a series of measures to help meet budgetary obligations. Can the member outline maybe in more detail the measures adopted? Well, um, certainly we're still in, in the process of discussing um, some of the outcomes from the business efficiency review. Um, I'll happily send uh, detailed information as appropriate because the Commission is a, a corporate body, but we'll certainly send the information uh, required as appropriate. I call Trevor Clark. Uh, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and can I welcome the answer in terms of the both uh, supplementaries as well, in terms of the Commission's desire to drive down the costs? However, is there not a conflict in relation to that, given the first question that was asked? in terms of actually translating some of this into Irish, that that's actually going to increase or make an additional cost to the Commission, and as such, is actually a waste of money. Well, Gawain Buechus and Kualta Dunkest Shin. I'd like to thank the member for that question, and um, the member will know that I was one of the people who um, believe that I'm being discriminated against in terms of written questions. I'm looking forward to the equality screening um, and the results from that. And I don't believe that uh, budget allocations or lack of them should be used in a manner that could potentially discriminate. I call Mickey Brady. I got the last Concordia. I thank the uh, member for answer so far. Could I ask, does the Education Outreach Service provide a good and value for money service? 
first of all, Gamwe has done called to Shin Shin Kesht on Tawuk. Um, I thank the member for the question. I believe that's a very important question. And I think I can speak for all of us here uh, as Assembly Commission members for our support for the Education and Outreach Service. I believe it does a tremendous job, especially given that this institution is a relatively new institution and it is important that members can feel um, whether they're school children, whether they're a group of active citizens um, or from wherever they come, our international visitors, that we have a very good, strong programme here. And I would like to put on record um, my uh, commendation to the, the staff that work uh, in that programme, because I think we'll all agree they do a very, very good job. And I call Chris Hazard to ask the question. Your Honour, to ask Concordia Kesha for a hot, let a hold question number eight. And the question will be answered on behalf of the Commission by Sam Gardner. Can I thank the member for his question? I am sure that the member will appreciate that not having a speaker in place has been a matter of concern for the Commission. The vacancy led has led some discontent disconnect between the Speaker's procedural, cooperative and representative roles, providing guidance and support to officials between Commission meetings is more difficult than when there was a, in a permanent chair of the Commission. However, just as the Deputy Speakers have agreed arrangements to ensure dis disruption uh, to the businesses of the, the House is maintained, the Commission too has put measures in place to maintain the operation of the corporate body in these circumstances. Call Chris Hazard for supplementary. Can call you and I thank the member for his answer. Does the member then agree that uh, the House not having a speaker impacts negatively on the Commission's ability to carry out its work? Can I thank you. Thank the member for asking the questions. To ensure continuity during this period, the Commission agreed on the 17th of September. 2014 that meetings which occur in the absence of a speaker would be chaired by a temporary chairperson from within the Commission membership on a rotational basis as far as reasonably practical in order to party uh, in order of party strengths the temporary chair for each meeting will be involved in both preparations and follow-up actions within the meeting they are chairing it was also agreed that the chief executive that the Clark Chief Executive would keep all members briefed on any significant emerging issues and seek informal advice via email or by convening short additional briefings of the Commission. The Commission will continue to keep the matter under close review and look forward to the appointment of a new Speaker. I call Old McGuinness for supplementary. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, could I ask this question? Uh, could a deputy speaker subsume the role of chairperson of the commission in the absence of an elected speaker? That has not been the case at, at the moment. If the speaker is not there, then a member of the commission will preside uh, on those occasions. And I call Ian Milne. Uh, Councillor Rennie, question nine. And the question will again be answered by, uh, on behalf of the Commission by Sam Gardner. Can I thank the member for his question. The Assembly Commission has not been given any specific consideration to providing additional resources to allow members to bring forward private member bills. Additional temporary resources have been allocated to provide support for the development of the committee's bill, being prompted by the committee of the Office of the First and the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister to reform and update the role and powers of the Assembly Ombudsman. However, the Assembly Commission does seek to ensure that adequate resources are available to support the work of the Assembly, including members' bills. The Commission's comments, commitments is evident by the significant resources currently de devoted uh, to supporting the development of increasing numbers of members' bills, proposals, and providing professional drafting services via the external contact. contract. The member will appreciate the difficulty of obtaining any further resources for private members' bills in the current financial climate. 
And that is the end of question time for today. I would ask